Hi, and thank you for joining me for my 21st weekly Sunday live stream. Today's a special one. Today is a collection of strange but true stories. And the first one is about a baseball player. We all know that Jackie Robinson was the very first African American to cross baseball's color line and play with the whites. But that same year, a white man by the name of Eddie Klepp crossed the color line going in the opposite direction became the first white man to play in the old Negro Leagues with a team called the Cleveland Buckeyes. This is called The Ballad of Eddie Clapp. Well, the war had finally ended. America had changed. It had beaten back the Nazis. But the Jim Crow laws remained. There was talk of staging marches. Talk of civil rights Talk about a Negro Playing baseball with the whites Well, he walked into the clubhouse While the card players could play And everybody stopped in the middle of whatever they were saying And it was just like when the sheriff into the saloon and he says my name is Eddie as he looks around the room this man's here to play baseball the manager said to the team we're all gonna have to live with this all that's not what I mean you know what I mean they all did, went without saying, and the card players looked at their hands and they went on with the plan. Well, they ran him off the field before he came in Birmingham one night, made him sit up in the grandstands in the section marked for whites. In his Cleveland Buckeyes uniform, there was a new twist on the law. The marshals kept their eyes on him, and the hecklers ate him raw. Eddie Clapp should have run the bases in reverse. A white man ride the same buses, stay in the same motels, and he could not eat in the same restaurants. He couldn't have mixed clientele. So while Jackie played for Brooklyn, wore the Dodger blue, Eddie crossed the color line, the one without a cue. A white man in the Negro Leagues might as well have been a Jew. Now you mention the name of Eddie Clapp, most everyone says who? So now I'm going to move on to Ireland. During the terrible famine in the 1840s. A lot of people emigrated, and those who stayed, uh, many, many, many died. And people died in such huge numbers that it was impossible to bury everybody properly, and especially the paupers, they were buried in mass graves. And there's one such mass grave in a town called Skibbereen, and in that mass grave at Abbey Screwy Cemetery are believed to be 10,000 bodies that were buried. And among them was a little three-year-old boy by the name of Tom Guerin. Now, the grave diggers, two days after burying Tom, were trying to make room for more corpses. And they plunged their shovels into the dirt, and they struck Tom Guerin's knees. And they heard him cry out, and they realized somebody was alive in there. And, and so they saved him, and Tom Guerin grew up to become quite a character. He was 
He became a bard, and he traveled around on foot, spreading the news of the day through poetry. And all he ever wanted from his efforts was a new pair of shoes from the county council, and he petitioned them. It took 20 years to get those shoes. But he finally got them, and this song is called New Shoes for Tom Gary. Scarbury and all of New York Well, some in Boston and others in New York I lived in the poorhouse, I slept on the floor There was room to sit down, but not an inch more The people who died were carried away Without ceremony and without delay my streams for a while you know that these are a pay whatever you want um, situation there's no ticket charge and this is my only means of making a living these days so anything that you can send as a tip I would be extremely grateful for and the URLs the links for how to tip me are in the comments the beginning of the comments on Facebook and on YouTube, they will also be in the comments just below the video and also in the chat window, which you might have to open up to see them. Well, you can see I'm wearing a t-shirt that says the Kerrville Folk Festival. And I drink my water every week out of a Kerrville Folk Festival cup. And I have been going to the Kerrville Festival every year since 1992 with just three exceptions now. I was going to say two, but they had to cancel it this year, unfortunately. So, um, it's an 18-day long folk festival, and I have stayed 18 days several times in the past. About 25 years ago, I had a girlfriend named Annie, and we stayed all 18 days at Kerrville together, and there came a point where we needed to buy some groceries in the town 10 miles away, so we took a drive out there, and on the way we saw a man selling pizzas off the back of his truck on the side of the road. Now apologies to any of you listening from South Carolina and Georgia, your peaches are great too, but Fredericksburg, pe Texas peaches are the best, and we had to have some. So we stopped, it was 100 degrees that day, and we just wanted to buy our peaches and get on our way, but the man selling them was one of these people that really likes to talk and talk and talk and talk. And 
I suppose I had had my fill because I started to take little baby steps backwards to the car hoping he'd read my body language. But no, he maintained that same distance and followed me and kept talking until suddenly out of nowhere he apologized for not having introduced himself, which is a very southern thing. And I was new to the south, but I understand this now. And anyway, he told us his name was Bill and I told him my name was Chuck and that that was Annie. He said, Annie, huh? I had a woman once in my life named Annie. And he started a whole new story, which I'm sure caused me to roll my eyes and sigh very deeply. But I caught something different in the tone of his voice and the look in his eye that said, Chuck, pay attention. And I'm glad I did, because he told me this. We stopped for peaches. A roadside stand Man said his name was Bill Said I'm Chuck and this is Annie He said Annie was the one And only true love of his life They met at his wedding But by then he had a wife It was during the reception In the spring of 64 Newlyweds, the best friend followed him out the barroom door. Maybe his ring got smaller. Maybe his finger swelled. Maybe he made a big mistake. Maybe time would tell. But the last, they feel what I feel. It. I do When Bill was at a loss Wondering now What should he do He did what he had to He'd just taken a wife She would take good care of him For the rest of her life Bill and Annie fought the urge They saw each other off him she was there in black The day Bill's wife Lay in her coffin By then she'd gotten married By then she'd moved away She'd asked Bill for his blessings He'd said it was okay a slice they were a little on the small side but they sure tasted nice he wanted him I do alas though I knew he knew so answered with a question asked him Bill do you well he said Annie pleased to meet you nice to meet you Chuck Annie and I would drove away in Annie's pickup truck with a box of 20 peaches, a homegrown tomato too, and a couple of things to think about, and every now and then, I do, I do. love to know where you're listening from today if you could put that in the comments also if you have any requests for feature shows songs you'd like to hear put those in the comments if you're interested in picking up any of my recordings whether they be digital or actual cds the links for how to do that are also at the very beginning of the comments and if you'd like to become my patron which would be awesome link for that is also at the beginning of the comments and that's the way that you can support me on a monthly basis and in exchange for that I give certain 
access to things that I wouldn't share elsewhere, like, uh, for example, I have a brand new song. And I debuted that on my Patreon site earlier in the week. I'm also going to be doing a special little hangout with my patrons over Zoom next Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock Eastern, I think. I'll have to double check the, the time, but it's next Friday afternoon. And if you're a patron, even if you sign up for only a dollar a month, you'll still get access to everything that everybody else gets access to. And so if uh, for the patrons that can't make next Friday, I will be scheduling uh, a second little hangout at night sometime in the next week or so. So I just mentioned I have a new song, which I debuted earlier in the week for my patrons. I'd like to play it for you now. It's a story song about something that actually happened uh, a year or two ago. There was a uh, there's a woman named uh, Ava Moses Kaur, and she was, uh, during the Holocaust, she was experimented on rather brutally by the angel of death, Joseph Mengele. And she survived the war, and a few years ago, or a couple years ago, an SS guard went on trial. He had 300,000 counts of accessory to murder against him, and this is what happened at the trial. Today's a day you used to wonder if you would ever live to see What kind of justice will there be? Nobody knew a thing about him Never talked about his past It was a shock to all the neighbors When it caught up to him at last He changed his name in Argentina He grew a beard and dyed his hair Bought a farm and raised a family And even they were unaware It's not the face that you remember It's not the one that you despise Today he's frail and he's remorseful No skull and crossbones in his eyes Now he's in his early just a week ago he fell Someone for him to die in prison Some wish he'd just go straight to hell not say he followed orders he does not mean his innocence he looks at you and not the jury they will decide if he should live he cannot ask them for mercy Just a week ago he fell 
someone for him to die in prison Some wish he'd just go straight to hell But when he whispered he was sorry The only words that he would speak It was a justice that you came for You let him kiss you gives me just about enough songs for an entire album of Holocaust story songs. Um, I also have enough baseball songs for Baseball Ballads 3. And I have enough regular songs for another regular album. But there's no work and there's no money to pay for albums these days, so what I will probably do is, uh, as I can spare a few dollars here and there, do a little bit of recording, and as I get one song at a time together, I'll, I'll make them available as singles. Um, I'll just state now, if anybody would like to contribute towards the making of an album, specifically towards the making of an album, that would be great, and that might actually allow uh, a CD to be pressed in due time. I want to move on to uh, a story about a very special gift that was given at Christmas time some years ago. There was a woman living in a holler in Virginia, and she found out about a little girl in the community whose mom couldn't afford to continue renting the flute that she was learning to play. And so this little girl, Catherine, had to drop out of the school band and was heartbroken about it. And when the woman in the holler found out about it, well, it turns out she had a couple of flutes. She had one in particular she hadn't played in many, many years. It was just sitting in a, in a closet. And she immediately knew she needed to give this flute to this little girl because musical instruments need to be played. They don't do any good just sitting in closets in cases. And so at Christmas time, she invited this little girl and her mother over to the cabin and she gave her this flute and this is called a toast to the woman in the holler Catherine's boyfriend played saxophone Catherine wanted a flute and there was one in the window of the music store that happened to be a real beaut but mommy couldn't afford it. And this much Catherine knew. Still she stood there a few minutes dreaming, knowing that it wouldn't come true. Christmas time was a coming. Catherine had the blues. Her mom asked her what she wanted. Catherine didn't tell the truth. Wasn't the money, not even for one to rent. But the only thing that Catherine really wanted was a plain instrument. Catherine cried for a month in her bedroom. She had to quit the school band. Now the woman that lived in the holler heard about the second hand and the goodness gathered within her and it fluttered like butterflies she in a vision released them she watched them take to the skies now on a very cold night in December maybe the coldest night of the year the woman that lived in the holler last few moments of glory and the glories that had all been before and the kind that would deliver 
rescue her She sent her flute down by the door Now people, they whisper about her Locals say she's a witch Oh, she'd be the first to come help them If they ended up in a ditch Those candles she lights at her altar They burn as a gesture of love The kind they talk about in the churches Yet they know so little of And so it's one day just after Christmas Catherine wore her new hat And her mom brought her out to the holler The woman was there with her cats idea but maybe someday she would and what she would soon be receiving was being given for a greater good so here's to the sweet gift of music here's to the power of song here's a toast to the woman in the holler for passing these things along This woman had scrawled from the magic places she had been to, trinkets from her own Mardi Gras, and it all meant nothing to Catherine, cause it wasn't her story to tell, oh she'll have her own words and stickers, should she ever fall under the spell. If you are interested in uh, hiring me for a private Zoom concert for you and your friends and family, please contact me any way that you like through Facebook or chuck at chuckbrodsky.com or reach me. And uh, these are a lot of fun. We, uh, we all log in about half an hour early and hang out. And I do two sets. And after the show, we hang out for another half hour or so. You can ask any questions. You can all mingle with each other. That's something you might be interested in doing. Please contact me about that. Also, if you'd like to have some songwriting help or critiques of your work, um, some pointers, I am available to do that on a private basis as well. I always wanted to write a song about Babe Ruth, given that I've written so many baseball songs through the years, but Babe Ruth's story is just too big. That song would go on for weeks. It would have thousands and thousands of verses because he was such a character. But there's one story in particular that I found out about, and it hit a little close to home. So that's why this is my one and only Babe Ruth song at the moment. It's about... Something that happened back in the day when, you know, the teams used to travel by train. And on the way back from spring training in Florida, they would make stops along the way and play exhibition games against minor league teams, often their minor league farm clubs. And this would give fans who lived in smaller towns a chance to see major league players. And it was on such a trip back to New York from Florida that the Yankees stopped in Asheville, North Carolina. Babe Ruth stepped out off of that train and collapsed. Uh, he, he 
turned out to be okay, eventually. But a newspaper in London found out about this and printed as the headline article, big bold headline, Babe Ruth died in Asheville, North Carolina. Well, even though it wasn't true, newspapers around the world picked it up on the wire. And so everybody around the world thought Babe Ruth had died right here in Asheville, North Carolina. Turns out he was very sick. And so this is called The Belly A Curd Round the World. I just want to say before I play the song that, uh, you know, this is my 21st weekly live stream. And all of the archives are up on my YouTube channel. And just this week, I put the set lists for each show into the comments below the video. So if ever you want to try to track down a particular song, it's a lot easier to find it now. Uh, and I'll do the same with this show um, in the next day or two. So this is the belly acre around the world. travel anytime too soon the babe departed Asheville on the following afternoon thousands jammed Penn Station to try to catch a glimpse as they carried him by stretcher to the waiting ambulance Helen, I feel rotten. 
Abe said to his wife before they took him to the hospital and he went under the knife the mighty B Cover. Hit lots more home runs More than any other By the time his playing days were done He said he loved his women And that he liked to stay out late That he liked the taste of liquor And he did not watch his weight The mighty be songs are from, so I won't even say. But it's about a fella who uh, in recent years has gotten a bit more attention on, uh, for the story. And by now, you're no doubt familiar with it. It's about a fella by the name of D.B. Cooper, the only person in aviation history to hijack an airplane and not get caught. So this is called The Ballad of D.B. Cooper. Passengers were let out, but the crew remained in 
inside Plane took off for Portland Just Cooper and the crew Wasn't but an hour Before he bid them all to do But first he tipped each one of them thousand bucks a piece he was such a nice man that later told police and not a little service doorway in the rear of the plane Cooper jumped into the darkness into the freezing rain they say that with the wind chill it was 69 below not much chance that he'd survive but if he did where did he go By the name of D.B. Cooper Was arrested and interrogated By a couple of state troopers But it wasn't him who did it The lawmen had no luck But the papers ran the story And the name D.B. Cooper stuck And it was on a family picnic Eight or nine years later Six thousand muddy dollars were Found by a seventh grader Banks of the Columbia, which would have been on his route. The authorities confirmed that it was part of Cooper's loot. Well, just who D.B. Cooper was, today is still a mystery. Is the only unsolved skyjacking history and no one's ever tried to claim a very large reward no one's ever seen him since he bailed out the door but divers search the river every summer still for an article of clothing or a twenty dollar bill a briefcase or a wallet with some kind of ID this D.B. Cooper might actually be This next song is one of my personal favorites. It's another Holocaust story song. It's about a man by the name of Adolfo Kaminsky, who, as a teenager, was working in the garment industry in Paris, France, when the war broke out. And he was recruited by the partisans to be a forger of documents because he had a scientific knowledge from working in the garment industry of inks, dyes, fabrics, what it took to make certain inks and dyes set in certain fabrics and what it took to unset them. And this made him a perfect candidate to undertake the forgery of passports and other important documents that would enable people to escape to freedom. And his work was so secretive, he was not allowed to tell anybody, not even his wife or his daughter. An apartment was rented for him as a workspace just a few blocks from where he actually lived with his wife and daughter. And he would go there every night and he would work all night long. He would never sleep. He would just work until he'd pass out. Whenever he came to again, he'd get back to work because they would give him impossible, impossible orders such as they need 2,000 passports by the next morning. And he was able to do this. He never let them down. Adolfo Kaminsky was able to forge 30 passports in an hour. And he realized that for every hour of sleep he might get, it would cost 30 people their lives. And so he didn't sleep, not if there was work to do. Well, at the age of 89, realizing 
life could end at any time, he decided he didn't want to take this to the grave with him, and he told his daughter Sarah Kaminsky. And Sarah wrote a book called A Forger's Life, which I read and which inspired this song. But this is called The Forger. On the third floor, I used to rent a room. I got no fresh air. You could get dizzy from the fumes. I'd spend the nights in there. Maybe I'd sleep a few winks. Clear a place somewhere between the papers and the inks. I had a printing press. It was my Tommy gun. I dreamed I'd ambush them Whenever it would run I couldn't shoot a man But this was what I could do With my documents The guards would have waved them through I didn't know them I never met them How could I turn away And just forget them Still can picture some of their faces. They were desperate to leave for safer places. I was an artisan, counterfeiter. I had a steady hand that didn't get the jitters. One day the partisans told me my skills were needed. There was madness on the rise that had to be defeated. A doctor names altered their ages, put a different place of birth upon the pages. I made them businessmen, I made them teachers, I made them someone else with all the same features. I didn't know them, I never met them, but how could I turn away and just forget them? Still can picture some of their faces, they were desperate to leave the safer places. my handler in busy cafes we would trade envelopes then go our separate ways no time for small talk too many lives at stake passports to reproduce all night I'd be awake I worked in secrecy nobody knew of this not even my daughter or my wife it was just too much risk. They said I worked too much. I couldn't tell them why. But now I have to tell someone before I die. I didn't know them. I never met them. How could I turn away and just forget them? Still can picture some of their faces. They were desperate to leave the safer places. I didn't know them. I never met them. How could I turn away and just forget them? I still can picture some of their faces.
we've come to the part of the show that ordinarily is uh, when I would offer you a magic trick and then switch to the piano. But since I'm not playing piano this week, I have a different magic trick. And this is called Puck View. And maybe in future weeks, I'll zero in on specific pucks and tell you a little about them. But I've got a pretty good size puck collection. And this is just uh, some of the best of the best. There are a whole lot more. Puck view. Uh-oh. There we go. So I guess I have time for maybe two more, two or three more. Um, let's go to Canada. There's a folk festival in a very small community of Canso, Nova Scotia, the end of the earth, furthest easternmost point on the entire mainland of North America. It's called the Stan Rogers Folk Festival. Stan Rogers was one of the greatest songwriters and singers the world has ever known. Had a very rich baritone voice. Stan died flying home from the Kerrville Folk Festival many years ago. And so this festival has been held in his honor ever since. Now, Stan's very last night at the Kerrville Folk Festival before he flew home. He spent it at the very campfire where I hang out and my friends hang out. And so going to that festival for the first time, I felt like an emissary for my friends and that campfire. So, you know, at a, a typical folk festival, you're scheduled to play throughout the week weekend at different times. And I had a bit of a period of time off. And I was in the green room, which is... Uh, they make use of the local Lions Club, which is just backstage. And that's where all the musicians hang out when they're not playing, and that's where they feed us. And so I was hanging out back there, and I noticed that a friend of mine from Canso, she's the wife of the fellow that books the festival, she looked like she'd been crying, so I asked her what was going on. And she told me it was the anniversary of a car crash that had happened years earlier that took the life of her uncle and two other people in town including this fellow by the name of Leo Kennedy. And she had just been up at the cemetery visiting her uncle's grave, and Leo's buried beside her uncle, and she realized Leo doesn't have any family anymore in the area to visit him. And that made her sad, because Leo was a real beloved figure. He had polio as a kid, and he grew up to become uh, a, a, a real character. He was a door-to-door -door salesman without a car, so he would walk carrying a couple of suitcases that contained everything you could possibly need in a household, like frying pans or an iron or sewing kits or mirrors or whatever it might be. And if he didn't have it, he'd get it. But people would invite him into their homes just to sit and chat and have, have a drink or a cup of coffee. And uh, he was a very beloved person. So when this was all explained to me, I realized I had some time before I was scheduled to play again. And I thought, you know, I'll go visit him. I was told that the cemetery overlooked the festival. It was, uh, you know, just kind of back beyond, behind the crowd up on a hill. And I would have a great view and would hear the music really well. And this was, uh, while a very special event at the festival that they do every year was going to take place. They call it Singing Stan. And they have oh, six, seven, eight different performers sing Stan Rogers songs as a tribute to him. Everything else shuts down, and they have this big event singing Stan. So I had never really heard Stan's music before, and I had, was looking forward to listening to this special um, show of his songs. And what better place to listen to from than the cemetery? So I started writing this song up there while I was visiting Leo. The ending of this song came about because of a rather uh, rather cool thing that happened. I was just about to, to head back to the festival grounds. I had looked at my watch and I realized that, well, I needed to make it back, pick up my guitar, and head off to my the next stage I was going to play at. And just as I took my first step in the direction back towards the festival, 
the person singing on stage, a woman named Laura Smith, sang the line, Stay for another song, son. It's right out of a Stan Rogers song. And so I felt commanded to stay for another song. And then I headed back to the festival, and this, that, that line uh, worked its way into the ending. So this is called The Ballad of Stan Rogers and Leo Kennedy, and I sing it for all my friends up in Guysboro County, Nova Scotia. <laughs> goes to visit Leo All but forgotten except by a few Heard somebody speak so fondly of him Made me wish I knew him I got directions to the churchyard I took a walk up on the hill It overlooks the Stan Rogers Folk Festival The year that I was on the bill Backstage dining hall There was a picture there of Leo Framed and hanging on the wall Such a good-hearted fella So say all the people I know that knew him It must have been someone that loved the man Whoever the artist was that drew him Decorate his vest Rolled up shirt sleeves and a funny hat That tilted slightly to the west I figured maybe he was there To keep a watch over the place Smiling down on everyone He had an old familiar face You're up in Canso, Nova Scotia It's just a flat stone on the ground He lies just next to Lumsden You might have to look around It's just a simple little marker Two hands clasped in prayer Well, I sat down beside it And I said a little one there heard about Stan Rogers. Now it was time to listen to him. The songs brought back to life again by people I knew who knew him. And I thought about a campfire in the Texas morning lights and that feeling that you leave with after being Tell the ballads of Stan Rogers I've been enjoying on the hill. Stay for another song, son. I thought I heard somebody say, For one more song, and I had to smile before I walked away.
So thank you very much for listening this week. Thanks for being with me. Once again, uh, because this is a non-ticketed event, I'm relying on you to tip as you will. And the information, the links on how to do that are at the very, very, very beginning of the comments if on Facebook. And if you're watching on YouTube, they are just below the video in the comments and also in the chat window. And I appreciate whatever you can give. If you're interested in recordings or becoming my patron, all of that information as well is there. Thank you very much. I hope you'll join me next week for my 22nd live stream. Keep in mind, if you've missed previous, ar uh, previous live streams and you'd like to see them, they're all archived on my YouTube channel. And if you could subscribe to my YouTube channel, I would really appreciate that. Also, if you're watching on Facebook, there is a little bell-shaped icon in the upper right corner. And if you click on that, you can be notified every time I go live on Facebook. So that would help me out a lot if you could do that. I guess I'll finish off with one more song that's from Cancel Nova Scotia. And this is a song about unquestionably the most incredible moments I have ever had on stage performing. This was several years back, probably 12, 15 years ago by now. I was doing my performance on the main stage and I saw a fellow out in the middle of the audience that was blowing kisses at me. It turns out he had a developmental disability. And it took me a couple of songs into my show to realize that because the stage lights were very bright in my eyes. And it wasn't until I shielded my eyes from those lights that his features came into better focus. And once I realized he had a developmental disability, I started to blow kisses back to him between songs when my hands were free. And this went on for the entire duration of my performance. And I knew as it was happening, I was gonna write the song immediately after getting home, which I did, and I recorded it onto a cassette tape. Yeah, we were using cassettes back then. And I mailed it to the folks that run the Stan Rogers Folk Festival who had become good friends of mine. Thought they'd appreciate hearing the song because they were there watching, witnessing all of this unfold. When I wrote it, I had no idea whether this man lived in Cancel, Nova Scotia, or if he was somebody brought to the festival from away. Because about 10,000 people come to the festival from outside the community. Cancel only has about 800 people, 700, 800 people living there. And so, it turns out that not only did this fella live in Cancel, but he was the most beloved person in their entire community. His name was Arthur Christie. Arthur was 75 years old at the time, and everybody in Cancel had grown up with Arthur. And after I wrote the song, even to this day, people pull me aside and tell me all sorts of great Arthur stories. Well, th through the years after I wrote the song, uh, every time I'd come back to the festival, Arthur would need no invitation to jump up on stage with me and start woo-wooing along. He would just do it, and it was awesome. Arthur passed away a few years ago at the age of 85, and I learned that somebody, when they had the headstone made for him, they had engraved into it the title of this song, The Man Who Blew Kisses. He wasn't so tall, he wasn't loud I could not tell you how he was dressed But of everyone there, I remember him best The man who blew kisses was simple and free He never considered how people might see him Walked on the water, swam through the air With no trepidation, and without a care The man who blew kisses, he lives 
in a home He isn't allowed to go out on his own But wherever they take him, he's happy to go He loves everybody and he lets them all know Again, stay well, have as happy a Thanksgiving as you possibly can, and I hope to see you next week.